Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. Today we begin a new module that is the Indian Penal Code. This module will have three lectures, an introduction to the IPC or the Indian Penal Code, where we will look at the historical backgrounds and what the IPC is all about, how it is arranged. Then we will have a look at the general exceptions under the IPC. General exceptions are the provisions that allow you to escape liability for those cases that are either justifiable or excusable. So, for instance, if you even kill somebody in self-defense, then that is excusable. So, that sort of things will come under the general exceptions. So, the second ex lecture will be the general exceptions under the IPC and then we will have a look at the punishments under the IPC. So, what kinds of punishments are given for various different kinds of offenses is what we will look in the third lecture. So, let us now begin with an introduction to the IPC. The IPC was formulated in the year 1860. So, what is the IPC? There are three words Indian, Penal and Code. Indian means that it extends to India or it is applicable to India. So, it covers the whole of the territory of India. Now, when the Britishers made the IPC, the, at that time we had the British India and so the IPC with certain modifications is also being used in other countries such as Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Singapore, Malaysia and so on. Now, penal refers to relating to. It is used for or prescribing the punishment of offenders under the legal system. So, penal is relating to the punishment of offenders under the legal system or it is a term used for the punishment of offenders under the legal system or it is something that prescribes the punishment of offenders under the legal system. So, basically penal means relating to punishment and code is a systematic collection of laws or statutes. So, this is the Indian penal code. This is how the IPC begins. Preamble, whereas it is expedient to provide a general penal code for India, it is enacted as follows. So, what is the objective of the IPC? It is to provide a general penal code for India. Now, section 1 of the Indian penal code begins like this. Title and extent of operation of the code. This act shall be called the Indian Penal Code and shall extend to the whole of India. So, this is the act and this act is known as the Indian Penal Code and it shall extend to the whole of India. Now, if you download the act or if you look at this act or the code in certain books, you will also find these words except the state of Jammu and Kashmir. So, this is what is written here except the state of Jammu and Kashmir, but it turns out that under section 95.1 of the Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Act 2019, these words have been omitted. So, this is what section 95.1 says, all central laws in table 1 of the fifth schedule to this act, this act is this Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Act, on and from the appointed day shall apply in the manner as provided therein to the Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir and Union Territory of Ladakh. So, what does table 1 of the fifth schedule say? The fifth schedule table 1 serial number 48 says the Indian Penal Code 1860. In section word 1, the words except the state of Jammu and Kashmir shall be omitted. So, this is what we have done here. So, these words have been omitted. So, now section 1 just says this act shall be called the Indian Penal Code and shall extend to the whole of India. Now, the next question is when we say the whole of India, 
what does that mean what is india now india in the context of ipc we can refer to india from the constitution of india so article 13 of the constitution of india states that the territory of india shall comprise the territories of the states so all the states come under this word india the union territories is specified in the first schedule and this specifies all the union territories so all the the union territories also come in india and such other territories as may be acquired <coughs> now this acquisition can come under various contexts so for example india can purchase a territory and can do this acquisition through purchase so if india purchases a territory from somewhere else then ipc will automatically extend to that territory similarly if india annexes a territory from somewhere or if india gets a gift of a territory from somewhere then to it will that territory will come under this definition of india and so the ipc will extend there so the ipc extends to the whole of india the second term is penal so what is penal penal is the adjective here that is qualifying the noun code so it is a penal code so penal is the adjective penal is relating to punishment and we call it a penal code or a penal statute because it defines offenses and prescribes punishments for commission of the offenses so as we have seen before ipc is a substantive law it has a lot of substance it defines offenses it defines or prescribes the punishments that a person will get if he or she commits those offenses and because of all that it becomes a penal code it is a code that is related to punishments so it defines offenses prescribes punishments the third term is code a code is a systematic collection of laws or statutes so basically it is a collection of laws or statutes so it is possible that earlier there was a different law for murder a different law for say theft a different law for other offenses but then what the ipc has done is that it has collected all of those so it, it is a collection of laws or statutes and not just any collection it is systematic so it is arranged in some manner and a code is the end product of codification which is the action or process of arranging laws or rules according to a system or plan so in the case of ipc there was this process of codification which was the action or process in which various laws and rules were arranged according to a certain system or plan other examples of codes include the code of manu or manusmriti the napoleonic code or the civil code of the french the code of justinian which was a part of the code of the roman law the indian penal code the criminal procedure code the civil procedure code and so on so code is a systematic arrangement of different laws and statutes now why do we need to have a code a code provides certain advantages it makes things simple so for example when somebody says that such and such person is a 420 it's a charge obese then everybody will relate to this term 420 with cheating so it makes things simple because otherwise people would have to remember whether an offense is uh, defined in the law or not under which law is a particular offense defined under which law is the punishment prescribed but in the case of ipc it makes everything simple you just have to refer to a number then it provides stability because it is a systematic arrangement of laws and statutes and rules so it provides some sort of a stability to the whole system as we have seen that the ipc was enacted in the year 1860 and it is still applicable today now this is an evidence of the fact that the code is very stable so there are hardly any uh, mismatches or any confusions which makes it very easy not to have a, la a large number of amendments
so it provides some sort of stability it is intelligible that is people can easily understand it there is a logical arrangement and coherence to that there is certainty because it has been referred to so uh, for such a long period that now everybody is certain what is an offense what is not an offense what are the things that if you do you will land up in jail so it provides certainty to the people and at the same time this certainty also leads to unity of the area where the code is applicable because throughout the territory of india people have been referring to these codes in different literatures in movies in plays and dramas and so on and so all these codes that are applicable to a large territory they also bind us together they make for a common mental makeup of all of the citizens so these are the advantages of codification let us now have a look at the historical background how was the ipc enacted so the ipc was drafted on the recommendations of the first law commission of india that was chaired by thomas piccoli so he was the chairperson of the first law commission and this law commission gave its recommendations that we should be having a common penal code this law commission itself was established in 1834 under the charter act of 1833 and the charter act of 1833 also known as the government of india act 1833 was enacted by the parliament of the united kingdom to extend the royal charter granted to the east india company for an additional 20 years so in those days the east india company was created by a royal charter and it was given this charter for 20 years at a time so every 20 years the parliament would come up with a law stating that okay we are now going to extend it for 20 more years or not so this charter act of 1833 it extended the royal charter that was granted to the east india company for an additional 20 years and it also worked to restructure the governance of british india and while doing this restructuring it was felt that certain common things are required now the draft code was drawn up and submitted to the governor general of india in council it was then revised why revised because as we have seen before the code is the end product of codification and codification is a action or process of arranging the laws and rules according to certain system or plan now this codification is what we are referring to here so a draft code was drawn up and then it was revised again and again and again so that it became coherent it became systematic and then the revised code was presented to the legislative council in 1856 then it took some time because we had the uh, the great indian revolution of uh, 1857 and after that the code was passed and placed on the statute book on the 6th of october 1860 and it came into operation on 1st of january 1862 so this is the historical background what are the features of the ipc the ipc is a codifying statute so it is a law that is passed and it codifies things it arranges uh, the uh, the various laws and rules in the form of a coherent structure it contains the general law of crimes in india so this is the general law of crimes as against special laws we have seen that before it is a substantive law so it defines offenses and it prescribes punishment for them but it does not give you the procedures to be followed so this is a substantive law it is not a procedural law and the procedure is governed by the crpc 1973 the ipc will tell you what is an offense but the crpc will tell you how to proceed if somebody has done this offense the ipc is an exhaustive or complete code in respect of the matters that are covered by it it lays down the general principles of criminal liability and also the general exceptions to criminal liability and it defines specific offenses and prescribes punishments for their commission attempt and preparation 
so we have seen before that any crime consists of four stages intention preparation attempt and commission now intention is never punishable but preparation in certain cases is punishable then attempt in certain cases is punishable and commission of the crime is always punishable now ipc tells you that the commission of such and such crime will lead to such and such punishment the attempt for such and such crimes will lead to such and such punishment and for certain cases even the preparation to commit the crime will lead to certain punishments now how is this code arranged what is the scheme of the code the code contains 26 chapters so basically if you look at the code then you will find chapter 1 to 23 but then three chapters were added subsequently that is 5a 9a and 20a then each chapter is divided into sections so when we say section 420 section 302 section 307 we are referring to those sections and these sections come under certain chapters and there are 26 chapters each section has been given a numerical figure for distinguishing it from others so when we refer to murder as section 302 that is the numerical figure that is given to that particular section section 511 is the last section of the ipc and basically this is the section that deals with attempts to commit offenses then the ipc does not have 511 sections because many sections have been added several sections have also been deleted over time but the number of the last section is section 511 we can divide the ipc into two parts the first part is general principles and the second part is specific offenses now general principles includes things like introduction now introduction defines names this particular code it defines many things it tells about the extent of operation it tells about the time of operation so that is introduction then you have general explanations then punishments general exceptions through which people can uh, avoid liability for crimes or liability for certain offenses then chapter 5 talks about abatement now abatement is encouraging somebody to do a crime so that is abatement chapter 5a deals with criminal conspiracy and chapter 23 deals with attempts to commit offenses another part is specific offenses now these parts are not arranged one after the other but this is just a way in which we can understand the chapters now specific offenses comprises of chapter 6 that is offenses against the state or against the government then chapter 7 is offenses related to the army navy and air force chapter 8 is offenses against the, the public tranquility chapter 9 is offenses by or relating to public servants chapter 9a is offenses related to elections chapter 10 is contempt of the lawful authority of public servants so basically if a public servant gives certain directions and people do not follow that do not follow that uh, lawful authority of the public servant then what kinds of offenses will be there chapter 11 talks about false evidence and offenses against public justice chapter 12 talks about offenses related to coin and government stamps chapter 13 is offenses related to weight and measures chapter 14 is offenses affecting the public health safety convenience decency and morals chapter 15 is offenses related to religion chapter 16 is offenses affecting the human body chapter 17 is offenses against property chapter 18 is offenses related to documents and to property marks chapter 19 is criminal breach of contracts to service in chapter 20 is offenses related to marriage chapter 20a which was added uh, which was added later is cruelty by husband or relatives of husband chapter 21 is defamation and chapter 22 is criminal intimidation insult and annoyance 
So, there are two things that are evident from this classification. One is that the IPC consists of a large number of chapters dealing with a large number of themes of crimes. And the second thing is it is such uh, it is arranged in such a manner that you do not have to read through the whole of the code to understand or to reach a particular section. So, for example, if there is an offense against the property, then you can directly go to chapter 17 and all the offenses that are related to property will be found here. All the offenses relating to marriage will be found in this chapter. So, when we say that a code is a systematic arrangement, then this is what we are referring to. It is not just a haphazard uh, arrangement of sections, but all the sections have been arranged in a coherent manner by dividing them into different chapters. Now, where does the IPC apply? So, the IPC talks about intra-territorial jurisdiction. Intra means inside. So, this is jurisdiction inside the territory and the territory is what is uh, what was defined earlier, it extends to the whole of India. So, this is jurisdiction that is inside India. Now, section 2 of the IPC says punishment of offences committed within India. So, this is only those offences that are occurring within the territory of India. Every person shall be liable to punishment. Every person means that this person may be a citizen or this person may be a foreigner. So, every person shall be liable to punishment under this code and not otherwise for every act or omission contrary to the provisions thereof of which he shall be guilty within India. So, for any act or omission that is done by this person and if this act or omission is contrary to the provisions, then he will be guilty within India and he shall be liable to punishment under this code. So, an offence under the IPC committed by any person, Indian or foreigner, within the territory of India can be prosecuted and punished by the court in India that is having the jurisdiction. So, anything that happens in India comes under IPC. But not just what happens in India, but even uh, uh, but uh, this code even extends the jurisdiction to areas outside the territory of India, which is known as extraterritorial jurisdiction. So, section 3 talks about punishment of offences committed beyond but which by law may be tried within India. So, these are for offences that are committed outside India. Any person liable by any Indian law to be tried for an offence committed beyond India shall be dealt with according to the provisions of this code. For any act committed beyond India in the same manner as if such act had been committed within India. So, the code is extending the jurisdiction of the Indian courts to those people who are liable by any Indian law to be tried for an offence committed beyond India. And when the courts are deciding or hearing these cases, then they will treat these cases in the same manner as if this act had been committed within India. Then there is also the extension of the code which is section 4, extension of code to extraterritorial offences. The provisions of this code apply also to any offence committed by a citizen of India in any place without and beyond India. So, if there is a citizen of India and even if the citizen of India is somewhere else outside India, then to all the offences that are committed by that person, that citizen will come under the purview of the IPC. So, this is an extension to extraterritorial offences. Then any person of, in, of any citizenship on any ship or aircraft that is registered in India, wherever it may be. So, if there is a ship that is registered in India and this ship is say in Australia and a Japanese citizen on this ship registered in India which is 
uh, which is presently there in Australia commits an offense, then the IPC also extends there. So, the ship or aircraft registered in India is basically an extension of the Indian territory. Any person in any place without and beyond India committing offense targeting a computer resource located in India. So, if there is a person of any citizenship anywhere in the world and if he or she targets a computer resource located in India and commits an offense in that manner, then it will also come in the purview of the IPC. Then there is an explanation. In this section, the word offense includes every act committed outside India, which if committed in India would be punishable under this code. So, basically what this is saying is, even if that particular act is not a crime in that particular country, but if that act is a crime in India, it is an offense in India, then it would be taken in the category of offense. And the expression computer resource shall have the meaning assigned to it in clause K of subsection 1 of section 2 of the IT Act 2000. So, it says that computer resource, this term will have the same meaning as defined in the IT Act. And how does the IT Act define it? Section 21K of the Information Technology Act says that computer resource means computer, computer system, computer network, data, database and software. So, all of these come in the category of computer resource. And if a person of any citizenship anywhere in the world is targeting a computer resource that is located in India, then and commits an offense, then it comes under the purview of the IPC. Then there is an illustration, A who is a citizen of India commits a murder in Uganda. Now, because this person is a citizen of India and murder is an offense in India and so this person can be tried and convicted of murder in any place in India in which he may be found. Now, what are the salient points of this extension? First, if an Indian commits an act of omission or commission outside India, which is an offense under IPC, then she or he can be prosecuted and punished under IPC by a competent court, although the act may not constitute an offense under the law of the land. So, even if it is not an offense in that particular country, but because it is an offense under IPC, so it will be or it can be tried here. Offense under the IPC committed by any person, Indian or foreigner, on a ship or aircraft registered in India can be tried by the competent Indian court, even though the ship or aircraft was outside India at the time of commission of the offense. Offense committed by a person outside India targeting a computer resource located in India can be tried by the competent Indian court. However, a person cannot be prosecuted and punished twice for the same offense, once under the IPC and also under the foreign law. So, basically there can be only a single prosecution and a single punishment for a single crime. So, either the person will be tried under IPC or will be tried under the foreign law, but you cannot have a double punishment. Now, in these cases, what will be the procedure? How will one go about initiating these uh, trials. Now, as we have seen before, IPC is the substantive law. So, it defines offenses, it prescribes punishments, but it does not tell you the procedures. We have seen before that the procedures are governed by the CRPC. So, let us now look at what the CRPC says. The procedure comes under section 188 of CRPC. Offense committed outside India when an offence is committed outside India by a citizen of India, whether on the high seas or elsewhere, or by a person not being a citizen on such ship or aircraft registered in India. So, these are those two categories. You have the citizen of India who was in the high seas or elsewhere, that is outside the country, or by a, a person who is not a citizen of India, but is on any ship or aircraft registered in India and there is an offense that is committed outside India. So, how will you know 
if this person has already been tried and prosecuted and punished outside. So, with th this is why you have this particular section. So, in these circumstances, he may be dealt with in respect of such offence as if it had been committed at any place in India at which he may be found. So, wherever you find this person, you can uh, try him or her for the offence, provided that notwithstanding anything in any of the preceding sections of this chapter, no such offence shall be inquired into or tried in India except with the previous sanction of the central government. So, basically this particular section is saying that for all of these cases, you need to have the previous sanction of the central government and this previous sanction of the central government will ensure that the trial will only commence if the person has not been prosecuted and punished under any foreign law elsewhere. So, that you do not have a double punishment for the same crime. So, this is where the provisions of safety come into picture. Now, for all of these offences, CRPC defines an offence as any act or omission that is made punishable by any law for the time being in force and includes any act in respect of which a complaint may be made under section 20 of the Cattle Trespass Act of 1871. So, in the case of CRPC, the offence is any commission or, omi or omission that is made punishable by any law for the time being in force. So, all of those things are offences. Now, before we move further, let us have a look at the Indian Penal Code itself. So, this is what the Indian Penal Code looks like. So, the Indian Penal Code arrangement of chapters. So, you see that you have all these different chapters with various sections. So, this is what we referred to earlier that the IPC has a large number of chapters and each of these chapters has a large number of sections. So, let us now look at what these uh, sections look like. Now, chapter 1 introduction has the preamble and we have seen the preamble before and it's, it contains these sections. First is title and extent of operation of the code. We have seen this section before, what is the title, where does it extend? So, it extends to the whole of India and the title is the Indian Penal Code. Then it talks about punishment of offences that are committed within India. Then it talks about punishment of offences committed beyond, but which by law may be tried within India. So, uh, and the extension of the code to extraterritorial offences. We have looked at all three, all four of these sections in great detail. Then section 5 talks about certain laws not to be affected by this act. Then chapter 2 is general explanations. So, it talks about definitions in the code to be understood subject to exceptions, sense of expression once explained, then it explains a large number of terms, things like gender, number, man, woman, person, public, servant of government, government, India, judge, court of justice and so on. So, basically, if in the act it says somewhere that a man will be punished. So, what does man refer to is what you will find in section 10. So, if you go to section 10, the word man denotes a male human being of any age, the word woman denotes a female human being of any age. So, basically if there is a child, then the child will also be covered in the definition of man or woman because they are human beings of any age, of certain age. But if it says person, then person will not just include these people, man and woman, but it will also include any company or association or body of persons, whether incorporated or not. So, this is where the definitions become important. When it says servant of government, it denotes any officer or servant continued, appointed or employed in India by or under the authority of the government. So, these things are important whenever you have to deal with a certain 
uh, category. Then after general explanations, we have punishments. So, chapter 3 deals with punishments. So, here you have punishments, construction of reference to transportation. So, we will look at, uh, at this whole chapter in more detail in one of the later lectures. So, let us leave it for that time. Chapter 4 is general exceptions. We will also look at general exceptions in great detail later on. Then you have abetment. What is abetment? Who is an abettor? What, how do you deal with abetment in India of offenses outside India? What is the punishment? So, all of these things are dealt with in this chapter. So, if there is anything, if there is any case in which a person has encouraged or supported somebody in committing of an offense, then how will you deal with that person will be covered in this chapter. And as we have seen before, all these sections are related to abatement and because of that in this code they have been put together in this particular chapter. Then you have criminal conspiracy, the definition of criminal conspiracy and punishment. So, as we have seen before, the substantive law IPC defines the offenses and prescribes punishment for offenses. So, these sections will tell you about that. Then chapter 6 deals with offenses against the state, waging or attempting to wage war or abetting waging of war against the government of India. Conspiracy to commit offenses punishable by section 121, collecting arms etc. with the intention of waging war against the government of India. So, all of these offenses are dealing with offenses against the state and in this case the state or the government of India. Then you have offenses relating to the army, navy and air force. So, all of these offenses that are related to the um, military of the country, the army, navy and air force that is uh, defense patterns are all combined together. Then you have offenses against the public tranquility which includes things such as unlawful assembly, being member of an unlawful assembly. Punishment, joining unlawful assembly armed with a deadly weapon. So, all of these things, things like writing, writing armed with a deadly weapon. So, all of these things are offenses against the public tranquility or the public peace. So, in these cases, the offender is trying to disturb the public peace. And so, all of these offenses are grouped together, all of these sections are grouped together in chapter 8, offenses against the public tranquility. Then you have chapter 9, offenses by or relating to public servants. So, if there is a public servant who is disobeying the law with intent to cause injury to any person, he or she will be dealt with in section 166. A public servant disobeying direction under law will, come, will be dealt with in section 166a. Punishment for non-treatment of victim. Public servant framing an incorrect document with intent to cause injury. Now, whenever you look at these offenses, you will uh, in a large number of cases, you will find that there is an actus reus that the public servant has framed an incorrect document and there is a mens rea with the intent to cause injury. So, if there is such a condition, then, it, then that particular public servant will be dealt with in section 167. Public servant unlawfully engaging in trade. Public servant unlawfully buying or bidding for property. Personating a public servant. Wearing garb or carrying token used by public servant with fraudulent intent. So, if there is somebody who is wearing the uniform of a police officer, then how do you deal with that? So, all of these things come under this chapter 9. Then chapter 9a is offenses relating to elections who is a candidate, what is an electoral right, what is bribery as an electoral offense, what is undue influence at elections, personation at election, punishment for bribery, punishment for undue influence or personation at an election, 
false statement in collection in connection with an election illegal payments in connection with an election and failure to keep election accounts so all of these sections come under chapter 9a which is offenses relating to elections then chapter 10 talks about contempt of the lawful authority of public servants absconding to avoid service of summons or other of other proceeding so basically if a public servant or the court has issued summons to a person and this person is just absconding from his or her location because he or she is trying to avoid these summons so in that case that person will be dealt with under section 172 absconding to avoid service of summons preventing service of summons non attendance in obedience to an order from the public servant non appearance in response to a proclamation under section 82 of act 2 of 1974 omission to produce document to public servant by person legally bound to produce it because the public servant can only work when he or she has the documents or he or she has the persons who can uh, for instance provide certain evidence or certain statements now if people do not come forward then those people can be tried furnishing false information to public servants refusing oath or affirmation when duly required by public servant to make it refusing to answer public servant authorized to question refusing to sign a statement false statement on oath or affirmation false information with intent to cause public servant to use his lawful power to the injury of another person now this thing happens very commonly that people try to furnish false information so that one of their neighbors or one of their relatives comes to harm if that is done then that person who has provided false information will be dealt with under section 182 resistance to the taking of property by the lawful authority of a public servant obstructing sale of property offered for sale by authority of public servant so in certain cases the uh, the property that have been confiscated are put on sale and if there are people who are obstructing the sale of that property then they will be dealt with under this illegal purchase or bid for property offered for sale by authority of public servant obstructing public servant in discharge of public functions omission to assist public servant when bound by law to give assistance now these kinds of sections or these kinds of provisions are there in a large number of laws we'll see later on that the indian forest act and the wildlife protection act both of those have made it mandatory for people to provide support to detect offenses or to catch the criminals if they are inside the forest so if people who are bound to do that are not doing that so in that case they will be dealt with here disobedience to order duly promulgated by public servant so if there is an order and somebody is disobeying that threat of injury to public servant if somebody threatens a public servant that if you do not do this or that then i'll bring you to such and such harm then that comes under section 189 threat of injury to induce person to refrain from applying for protection to public servant so all of these come under chapter 10 chapter 11 is of false evidence and offenses against public justice including things like giving false evidence fabricating false evidence punishment for false evidence giving or fabricating false evidence with intent to procure capital uh, conviction of capital offense if innocent person is thereby convicted and executed so if somebody gives a false evidence and because of that somebody else is convicted and executed then the person who gave or fabricated this false evidence will be dealt with under section 194 giving or fabricating false evidence with intent to procure conviction of offense punishable with imprisonment for life or imprisonment threatening any person to give false evidence using evidence known to be false so even if you know that there is certain evidence and that is a false evidence that is a fabricated evidence and still you are using it providing it to a public servant or to the court of law then you will be dealt with in section 196 issuing or signing false certificate 
using as true a certificate known to be false. False statement made in declaration, which is by law receivable as evidence. Using as true such declaration knowing it to be false. Causing disappearance of evidence of offense or giving false information to screen offender for capital offense, imprisonment for life and, and imprisonment of less than 10 years. Intentional omission to give information of offense by person bound to inform. So, if you are bound to inform something and you are intentionally omitting to give that information. So, omitting to give the information is actus reus here and you also have an intention that is a mens rea. Giving false information respecting an offense committed. Destruction of document to prevent its production as evidence. False personation for purpose of act. So, all of these things are coming in this chapter. So, you can see that there are a large number of sections in the IPC. Then you have offenses relating to coin and government stamps. So, what is a coin? What is counterfeiting of coin? What is counterfeiting of Indian coin? And then it talks about these sections like making or selling instrument for counterfeiting coin. So, even if somebody sells this in this instrument through which you can counterfeit a coin, that too again is punishable. Making or selling instrument for counterfeiting Indian coin. Position of instrument or material for the purpose of using the same for counterfeiting coin, if the coin is an Indian coin. Abetting in India the counterfeiting out of India of coin. Import or export of counterfeit coin. Import or export of counterfeits of Indian coin. Delivery of coin possessed with knowledge that it is counterfeit. So, if you know that a particular coin is counterfeit and if you give it to somebody else. Delivery of Indian coin possessed with knowledge that it is counterfeit. Delivery of coin as genuine when which when first possessed the deliverer did not know it to be counterfeit and so on. So, all of these offenses that are related to coins and to government stamps are dealt with in this chapter. Then you have offenses relating to weights and measures, fraudulent use of false instrument for weighing, fraudulent use of false weight or measure, being in possession of false weight and measure, making or selling false weight or measure, all of these come under chapter 13. Then chapter 14 is offenses affecting the public health, safety, convenience, decency and morals, things like nuisance. So, if somebody is creating a public nuisance, he or she will be dealt with in under section 268 of chapter 14. Negligent act likely to spread infection of disease dangerous to life. So, there can be negligent acts and there can be malignant acts. So, negligent acts means that you were just negligent, you did not take care, you took it in a in a casual manner and because of that you did something that is likely to spread infection of disease that is dangerous to life. But in certain cases you can do it with a malicious intent that is for instance you have uh, knowingly and willfully you have done something to spread infection of a disease dangerous to life. So, these two sections are different. Disobedience to quarantine rule, adulteration of food or drink intended for sale, sale of noxious food or drink, adulteration of drugs, sale of adulterated drugs, sale of drug as a different drug or preparation, pulling water of public spring or reservoir. So, if there is a public spring or a reservoir of water and somebody dumps a waste to make it bad, then he or she will be dealt with in section 277, 278 making atmosphere noxious to health. So, if somebody is for instance burning waste in such a manner that is it is creating a large number of fumes and is making the uh, air unhealthy, then in that case that person will be dealt with in this section. Rash driving or riding on a public way, rash navigation of vessel, exhibition of false light mark or buoy. Conveying person by water for hire in unsafe or overloaded vessel. So, if somebody is 
conveying persons that is is taking persons from one place to another on a water body through hire that is the person is taking money for that and is taking people in a vessel that is a ship or a boat that is either unsafe or is overloaded so that person will be dealt with in section 282 danger or obstruction in public way or line of navigation negligent conduct with reference with respect to poisonous substance negligent conduct with respect to fire or combustible matter negligent conduct with respect to explosive substance negligent conduct with respect to machinery negligent conduct with respect to pulling down or repairing buildings negligent conduct with respect to animal all of these things are offenses then in chapter 15 you have offenses relating to religion injuring or defiling a place of worship with intent to insult the religion of any class deliberate and malicious acts intended to outrage religious feelings by any class by insulting its religion or religious beliefs disturbing religious assembly trespassing on burial places uttering words etc with deliberate intent to wound the religious feelings all of these are dealt with in chapter 15 chapter 16 is offenses relating the human body so things like offenses affecting life in this case you have culpable homicide you have murder culpable homicide by causing death of person other than person whose death was intended 302 punishment for murder so when we say section 302 is for murder and 307 is attempt to murder so this is what we are referring to then 303 is punishment for murder by life convict then you have punishment for culpable homicide not amounting to murder causing death by negligence dowry death abatement of suicide all these things are offenses related to life then you have offenses of causing miscarriage of injuries to unborn children of the exposure of in, of infants and of the concealment of births so miscarriage or causing miscarriage is an offense under uh, uh, section 312 but if it is causing miscarriage without women's consent then you deal with in uh, section 313 so this is a more grave offense then death caused by the act act caused with the intent to prevent child born of being born alive or to cause it to die after birth all of these come under the this section uh, chapter then you have hurt and grievous hurt voluntarily causing hurt voluntarily causing grievous hurt punishment for all of these wrongful restraint and wrongful confinement of people using of criminal force and assault kidnapping abduction slavery forced labor sexual offenses unnatural offenses so all of these are dealt with in the ipc then chapter 17 deals with offenses against property here you have things like theft, extortion, robbery, decoity, criminal misappropriation of property, criminal breach of trust, receiving of stolen property, cheating. Now here when you say section 420, it is cheating and dishonestly inducing delivery of property. So all of these are dealt with in this chapter. Then you have fraudulent deeds and disposal, uh, disposition of property, mischief criminal trespass and so on then chapter 18 deals with offenses relating to documents and property marks then you have criminal breach of contracts of service offenses relating to marriage cruelty by husband or relatives of husband defamation criminal intimidation insult and annoyance and then we come to the final section section 511 under chapter 23 attempts to commit offenses so this is what the IPC is all about. So these are all the different things that the IPC deals with. Now in this lecture we have looked at the IPC, the meaning of IPC, what is Indian, what is penal, what is code, what is the process of codification, what is the historical background of IPC, how are the sections in the IPC arranged, then we looked at various chapters which have a listing or a congregation of different sections that deal with similar offenses and we saw that the ipc is a substantive law 
it defines offenses and it prescribes punishments for them it is applicable within the territory of india but it is also applicable for offenses that are done by indians outside india or offenses done by any persons on a ship or an aircraft that is registered on in india or done by any person who is targeting a computer resource that is located in india and we also saw that the procedures are not there in the ipc the procedures are dealt with under the procedural law which in this case is the crpc so that's all for today thank you for your attention jai hind